Have you ever had the feeling that you've been here before? Takes you back, doesn't it? Boy, I haven't seen this in a long time. Oh, there she is, the best 16mm film camera ever. Come to daddy. When this came out, it was like a miracle. You suddenly felt a sense of freedom. The Cine King um, Color Tran. We'd rather forget about, really, wouldn't we? I think so, very much so. You could hardly be subtle with something like this. I can't even get the thing open. <laughs> When these ran at full rate, bang, bang, yeah. went the fuses. Well, here we are, gentlemen. I have to move that piece of furniture, I think. That goes onto the centre spindle like that. The Inky Dinky, the Queen's favourite lamp. No, I haven't done this for a long time. Don't David, you go in incandescent. Oh. Ah. You get sync all right, Bill? No. I think this is upside down. <laughs> it's amazing what you forget. Do we have a dimmer on these? We don't know. What do you think? Uh, hang on, hang on. We're not going to blow his mains, are we? So here we go, Alan. Look at this lot. Takes you back, doesn't it? It does indeed, yes. Um, that is the familiar kit, really. Yes. These we'd rather forget about, really, I wouldn't think we? So, very much so. The Cine King um, Color Tran. Absolutely appalling. Yeah. Well, the thing I remember most about them is to start with, you can't really control them. No. They came with different lenses. Yes. In theory, there was flood, medium, and spot. That's correct. Which yeah. was just a name right. like any I other. Know, they could I have know. called them yeah. Fred, Bill and Harry, really, because yeah. it made no difference. The, the thing that was different on all of them was the colour. That's true. They were called Colour Tran, and, uh, <laughs> and basically that was because they were multicoloured. I remember once having to light in a cloister that had w white pillars all the way down, and I lit the whole lot with these Colour Tran, and every white pillar was a different colour. Yes. There was yeah. purple and green and white and just... But the thing is, that on the... On the ballast, as they used to call it, yeah. there was a, a colour temperature meter. Yes. And as you turned the light up, it got brighter. Yes. And the colour changed. the colour changed. Cha yes. Went up. Yes. Yeah. But the, the problem was that in a domestic situation, the four lamps all came out the one transformer, yeah. which went into a, a, a normal domestic supply amp on socket. a 13-amp socket. Yeah. Now, when these ran at full rate, it was 40 amps. Bang. Bang. Yeah. Went the fuses. Yeah. So, um, man, luckily time, we didn't man. have these for very long. So, but no, then we each. finished up with something we all liked a lot better. That's true. Which is what we used to call in uh, the BBC a one man kit. That's right. Which was basically, was it three or it four? Was four, of, four of these redheads, we called them. They're yeah. 800 or 1,000 watts. 800. 800 watts. And the two, uh, two kilowatts. Two kilowatts. Mm. Quite controllable. Spot and flood That's fairly right. well um, with barn doors and so on. They, um, they, there's something they're slightly quite different, light. Yeah. but uh, that wouldn't get passed in the BBC because if I can open it up, we used to, on many occasions, the bubble, as we call it, as you know, the bulbs, yeah. the bulb in there, look, used to explode. And on one occasion, um, in a very expensive house, it scattered all over the carpet and a new carpet had to be paid for. <laughs> and so what they, what they did, they put like a Pyrex dish, it was a, a heat proof yes. glass yeah. that used to go in there. So when these bulbs exploded, they never hit anybody because no. they could be quite close to uh, it the It could the be person. very dangerous, yeah. I've seen it happen, yeah. Uh, the fact was that um, they were they're running at such a high temperature um, and, they're, you know, they're only glass and um, if anybody had touched the surface of the glass before they, when they put this in, a new bulb in, if you touch it with your fingers, it would go. But I mean, this became our sort of workhorse kit. It did indeed, yeah. For many years. Yeah. I, I can't remember, I wouldn't remember to put dates on it really, but it was a long period of time when yeah. we, these were the one-man kit all the time. Yeah. With these lamps, because they got so hot, to diffuse them or to lessen them, you couldn't put often 
Um, even papers would burn eventually, or the gelatine would burn. So they brought these wire meshes out, which did take the light down. They could diffuse uh, a little diffuser, bit, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, didn't burn. But I used to put uh, tracing paper across the front of these to That's soften right. the light. Yes. But it, uh, it, it had been burning for a few hours, you'd start seeing it going brown in brown the middle. Brown in the middle. So if we start, I've got to know from you which film we use? What film you're going well, to we, use? Most of the film we used for a long period to understand a film was, was, was uh, tungsten balance. It was, it was balanced for, for artificial light, which is, what, uh, 3,200 3, Kelvin? That's, uh, that's and, correct, yeah. And, um, but so if you went outdoors, then you had to put filter on the camera. And that, but also you had to filter the lights to turn these sort of lights, which are incandescent. And the, these are 3,200 Kelvin. So they, you are looking to convert that to daylight, which means getting up to 5,600 Kelvin and, uh, and make it match daylight. Otherwise, you put that on somebody's face in, out in the daylight and you finish up with blue there and, and orange here. The worst thing really is to, um, for us, is for the pair of us to make a mistake. And I light it for incandescent and David has got uh, filming for daylight. And uh, the two are we did have daylight film as well, which, which yeah. we used. Not we did use in, in, in daylight situations, and of course, if you're using a daylight film indoors, then you had to filter that to match. Yeah. So it's always playing one against the other, mm -hmm. and always fighting for light. Never enough. We never had enough, especially yeah. once you've got to start filtering both a camera and a light. Every and time a you put a filter on, you cut down the level of light. There's the crocodile clips. Put the filter on the front of the barn doors with these and we put one on each door like this and try and keep it as tight as possible and that's what we'd, we'd put the filter on with that. The sparks would usually have these already cut in a, yeah. in a folder or whatever for different sizes of lamps. And let's say, for instance say that there's a lot of sunlight coming through the window of this house and it'd be too bright. Then we use neutral density which is this, the same as the sunglasses really. And um, this will go over the window. And if again, uh, the cameraman was on in incandescent, then we'd have to put this across the window and this one, uh, which is an 85. So the sun now becomes incandescent through the window. That had its own problems because being a gelatine, no matter how carefully it was put on the window, it would, have, it would have crinkles and creases in it. And wherever you put a light, you'd get this dreadful light picking up on, the, on those things. On top of that, the slightest breeze and a crackle. So filter was important, very important actually. Um, and, but it did have problems when you fix it to windows. You know, it could be a sound problem if you didn't get it on the window correctly because it would start to flutter and uh, give you a lot of problems with the, uh, our gentleman of the sound department. I uh, didn't like it. Made them grumpy. <laughs> it did, didn't it? Yes, yeah. It's like going into a museum. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I haven't seen this in a long time. Oh, well, well. Well, I can't carry them things around any longer. They used to kill me years ago. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, what do you yeah they work. You're going to just, just put a red head on it? I'll just put a head on it and just see if we can get it working and try and work out which these plugs are supposed to feed it. No, I haven't done this for a long time. I suppose we could light this set, couldn't we? Could really? we light this set? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's even, already lit, mate. Even that well, quite. <laughs> well, this is how it would be if it was a documentary, of course. I'll tell you what I'll do, Tommy, is I'll get my umbrella out. I was always interested in soft light. Thank you. What were you shooting at the time, Brian? Old oh, documentaries, Man Alive. So, well, what's the wattage of those boxes? Uh, 500. Oh, oh, my goodness <laughs> me, that doesn't work. Do we have a dimmer on these? We don't know. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> What do you well, think I thought is? you were ahead of the game, mate. Sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this was my attempt at soft lighting. Well, I was always looking for soft light. Um, and as I say, there was no such thing, basically. No, there were no soft light units. Um, 
unless you made it yourself. And so it was a matter of, you know, finding bits and then making the other bits to make it work. So you came back with an umbrella. And then, as I say, I designed this and the department at Ealing Studios made it for me. This, this preceded things like the breeze light, which are now massive, as anybody in our industry would know. Primarily, breeze light was primarily designed, again, for the, uh, for the uh, photographic industry. But yeah. now, uh, a lot of big commercials, glossy commercials, they find they might have half a dozen breeze lights, plus four or other lighting on them. Mm. So, I mean, one thing we use now all the time is poly, yeah. polystyrene. There was no such thing in those days. So now that you get away with just one, even that, even one. Even now, that's too powerful. Even too yeah, bright now, you know. The way we used to have to diffuse was quite difficult as well. All we had really was tracing paper and what was called spun glass. And spun glass, which was spun glass, was, was is illegal now anyway. Oh yeah. But tracing paper, which was around, because there was such so much heat generated that you were continuously changing the trace paper. So there was all, mm. directors would get angry, DOPs Absolutely. would get angry, everybody would get angry. And, uh, well, in the end, you put it on wooden frames to yeah, keep it away from the light frames, source, yeah. which will give you a, a softer light anyway. Yeah. You know, to find different ways of, of creating soft light. It was also to use bed sheets. You just hang them up. I mean, it looks like a Chinese laundry when I'm lighting, but it's also, <laughs> it gives you a soft yeah. ambient light. Um, which is virtually shadowless. And, and of course, when people walk into it, it doesn't mean you have to keep relighting. So that was the soft light. So when we went to do interviews, I'd just take this with me and Tommy and the boys would set it up um, or the equivalent of it. I yeah. mean, I only ever had this one, yeah. which was basically all you needed. Thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, don't know, I don't know what we'd have done if it had a few more. <laughs> 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 it drive, drive us all round the bed, but it was effective, wasn't it? Well, it worked. It was great, and it and was it a great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But these nothing. were the kind of starters, you know. There was nothing around. We had to well, on a we, flyer all the time. <laughs> we were making up as we went along, basically. Yeah. The, I mean, if you're talking about um, the actual time for setting up, traditionally, if you're going to an ordinary domestic environment and you're going to do an interview with somebody, then uh, usually the director, myself and the sparks would go in and quickly, very quickly decide where we're, how we're going to film it, where we're going to put the chair. Um, and then Anna and I would get it lit. And with, with this sort of kit, you're talking about as little as 20 minutes. It mm. could be a bit, depending on other problems, but you, yeah. could, you could do it that quickly. What I would always use, and I suspect we haven't got it here today, is that I would have a, a, a three or four by four piece of poly. Polystyrene, yes. Yeah. I have that behind the camera with mm. the 2K bounced on it. Now that was my fill light, and the, then apart from that, there would just be kick a, lights. On. There'll be a, there'll be a light, mm. a key light on the on the on the face, fill light from the poly, a bit mm. of backlight on the opposite side to the key light, and then if the background needs a bit of light, another one for that. But that was pretty quick, and that was that would light mm. a talking head as far as I was concerned. The beauty of using very soft light as a fill light behind the camera is again, you're making the sound line your best friend. Because with a hard light behind the camera, the, 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 we have a hell of a job to get the, the microphone out of, uh, we're not creating a shadow in, in the yeah, set. Yeah. And the, uh, for sound department, generally in all filming, whether it's filming a talking head or even a drama interior. You forgot one thing? What? Glasses. Oh yes, well. Person yeah. wears glasses, you've got a problem there as well. Well, you've you? got to make everything a lot higher usually which can be annoying because you finish up with shadows under the, under the nose. But that's the only way around it is, um, I mean, actors learnt, of course, if they're wearing glasses, they learnt to have special glasses, which had actually had, they had them with well, the glass tilted downwards a bit. And that, that solved the problem if you're an actor who was on set all the time. But if you're filming an ordinary member of the public with glasses, yes, it could be a problem. And all you could do was, was put the lights a lot higher and hope they didn't tip their head up too much. But Bald headed um, people, we've got to take that into account. Yes. You know? Yes, with the backlight especially, yeah. 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 And what was that, the question of eyebrows? So there was a cameraman that had a special term, he called them certain, like Grecian arches or something. You must get the light under. The, I mean, it's We true, all had our quirks. The windows, they're the windows of the soul, aren't they? Actors act with their eyes. Yeah. And many times you have, you, if you're doing a dramatic scene, this little chap, would, would come into use the inky. for the inky dinky. 
the Queen's favourite lamp. Um, this would come into use. Uh, and David would, Lean's favourite lamp, apparently. Yeah, evidently, yeah. yeah. And it would put that little white point of light onto the eyeball. And uh, it just gives it that, you know, atmosphere. It's good. It would also, for people that have got a few lines around here, you know, it helps to remove them. Put a paper in that, an 85 or whatever you wanted. And, Let's um, see. The, I don't know whether it's pertinent at this point, but the, the, the history of why that's called an inky is quite interesting. It's um, because this, most of these funny names for lamps originally came from Hollywood. And in the early days of Hollywood, everything was lit with arc lamps, which were enormous, difficult things to handle, but created enormous amounts of light, which they needed in the early days with low, slow film stocks. But somebody came up with this little gizmo for when you want to get a bit of a little tiny bits of light in, instead of these enormous arc lights. And this was the only incandescent light on the set. So it became known as an inky. inky yeah. You didn't know that, did you, Alan? <laughs> <I didn't know. laughs> so that's why this became known as the inky, because it was the only incandescent light on yeah. the set when everything else was, was arcs. Mm. Um, and of course the name stuck. And this is the type of lamp, I, I mean, a, basically a, a focusing spotlight with a Fresnel lens, was what we always used before any of this. And, and when I first started at the BBC, this is what we were using. And there were just a whole range of these. This is the smallest. At what, 300 watts this, was it? 150. 150. Mm. It should also perhaps be said at this point that the normal procedure would be that the cameraman or camera crew, no, the only per person who ever touched lights was the, were the electricians. And this is not just because of what you might think today as normal health and safety regulations, though that was part of it, obviously. It was a sort of, it was a demarcation thing. And, and the sparks would get upset if, if, you, if you handled their lights, <laughs> uh, some more than others. It was health and safety. Uh. This does bring um, back a lot of memories. This, I mean, we look at it now, but I can see it in its boxes in a car. And I arrive at... Um, a location to do uh, probably a documentary and in interview and I saw it's on the third floor and there's no lift <laughs> and when you get all this boxed up and it's all in the back of an estate car and you've only one pair of legs and two hands it used to be really quite hard going sometimes you used to meet quite a few famous people when you did this didn't we oh we did yes, yes. yes. I mean I remember working on a panorama and uh, they knew what I was like so they said to me um, on this next interview behave yourself yes be a bit of decorum <laughs> we want a bit of decorum out of you Alan so I said all right and I said where am I going I said you're going to interview the um, chief rabbi of Israel and we're going to go and do some exteriors get the lights set up now decorum so I arrived at the chief rabbi's office in Jerusalem. I was shown into his office. Very nice chap. Would you like coffee or tea? I said, well, do you mind if I get the lights ready? And then uh, he said, no. So I got the lights ready. Then he said, come on, sit down, have your tea. And I sat down, trying to behave myself. And he leant over the desk and he looked at me and he said, do you know any good Jewish jokes? <laughs> and I said, I know hundreds. <laughs> and after a while, the door opened and the director of Panorama walked in to see the pair of us absolutely rolling around in hysterics. <laughs> oh, there she is. Come to Daddy. Didn't remember it being as heavy as this. <laughs> First thing to do is get rid of that. That's only for use on the tripod. Now that is the camera I lived with happily for nearly 20 years. Jealously guarded in my locker. Went round the world with these several times. And in my view, the best 16mm film camera ever. Uh, there were those who would dispute that. Some people preferred the Arri version. Of, of a self blimp camera, but this was just, it was just built to be used. It's, it's, 
it's ergonomically superb and uh, it's, you can just do anything you like with this camera. You can put it on a tripod and uh, add all sorts of bits on it, extension viewfinders, all sorts of stuff and do you know, high-level high drama but basically it came into its own when it was doing a lot of handheld what they now call fly on the wall documentary style of stuff because you could handle it so easily um, handheld in any direction you like you could look at it down or up before we use the zoom a lot I would use this with two two lenses usually a, a 12 mil lens and a 25 mil lens and whilst the camera was actually running you could quickly change the lens and the little bit of film that ran while you were changing it you'd always have a cutaway to get rid of it so you keep the sync going without ever having to uh, stop the camera later on we did it all with with a zoom lens uh, but for a long time I used the, the, the turret mainly because the lenses were better and faster if we were filming indoors for example without lights these lenses these prime lenses were more suited to uh, uh, to low light levels than the zooms were so I was quite a long time I was a bit reactionary about zoom lens I preferred using prime lenses for quite a long time before I was beguiled into using a zoom lens this is what we call a displacement magazine where the magazine sits on the top of the camera and as the as the feed side gets smaller the take-up side gets bigger so it's dis that's displacing that which keeps that fairly compact but it's still a lot of weight on top of the camera which is ergonomically not brilliant for hand holding the whole concept here is coaxial so the feed side is there and the take-up side is there and on the same axis which means that the film has to take a rather odd path because it has to go through a little twist to, but, it, but it means that the whole weight of the camera is, is snug and not perched on top as cameras always had been up till then and that's one of the things that transformed the use of this camera So when this came out it was like a miracle basically plus it was designed as you can plainly see this is not the most comfortable camera in the world to hold basically as a hand holding device I mean it is it is comfortable but it's not at all well balanced whereas ah, this one my memory is this weighs a ton yes. <laughs> this one of course was completely different because you could you could bring it back onto your shoulder, your shoulder yep. and work with it like this more manageable yeah so it was a better balance and then when you moved you could actually lift it off your shoulder so the body didn't transmit the vibrations into the camera especially as I'm not as young as I was unfortunately um, but it is I mean it is a great camera where well, there were all sorts of attachments a bit like this um, one was for focus so you could you could control the focus by using this hand here you could revolve your focus on this side I could operate the zoom which is what the sound recorders was looking for and when I had another one fitted here so that I could change the aperture if we went from exterior to interior all in one shot and on the top here I had mounted um, I mean what is a, a shoe like on top of most cameras these stills cameras and, and in that used to be an exposure meter so that I was complete without having to do anything virtually without taking my hands off the camera so I was basically designed it so that I could go anywhere at any time with this at night it's very low you're very low key basically um, you know you dress in dark clothes you've got this um, you can, oh yeah absolutely you can hold it under your arm um, so it's it was a great camera, much, great design. I mean, look at the difference. You could hardly be subtle with something like this, or this even. I mean, that was considered great in its day. But then when we got this, you suddenly felt a sense of freedom. You were very mobile. You know, you, for me anyway, I mean, I can't speak for other DPs, but, you know, I thought of my body as a kind of steady cam even before Steadicam came out on the market it was being flexible so it was going into the gym and 
building up this, you know, your upper body strength and your legs so that you're able to sort of just be as flexible as you can. Because, you know, if you go into a dangerous situation, you need to be alert as to what's going on around you. So it's learning to use your left eye as well as your right eye and being, you know, ready to move as fast as you possibly can um, and not be sort of held down with the equipment. I mean, part of this was, I mean, this is a conventional, oh, this was a conventional battery. Now, if you feel the weight of that, you've got this over your shoulder, which is fine. But then we designed what we called the battery belt. So we had a belt, all of that was in a belt, a leather belt around the, oh, there you are. Absolutely. So, you know, the difference between this and this was amazing. You know, this is throwing you off balance. Whereas here, you know, you, this is all about, is over your centre of gravity. Oops, I can't put it on because of the microphone. <laughs> um, but you've got this around your waist, so, you know, you're over the centre of gravity. Still heavy. But, oh yeah, it's heavy, yeah, but yeah. it's easy Same to way. carry it that around nice heavy, it? It's not going to throw you off balance. Yeah. We were filming a, a, a documentary in, in Sardinia about the Aga Khan, who was building a whole new holiday, holiday complex there called the Costa Smeralda. And we were due to do an actual interview with him. The day before that happened, we got a telex to say that, they, that uh, the studios were sending us out a new camera to, for us to evaluate. It was the Eclair. We'd heard about the Eclair, but we hadn't seen one. So I had to take the morning off and go to the airport and collect these boxes and open it up and looked at this thing. I thought, what on earth is that? No instruction book, nothing. So I, I just had to buy trial and error, as I am now, because I've forgotten how you do it. No, I haven't. It comes back, doesn't it? Um, learn how to load the magazine. I might ask John to come in at this point. So You got it. That's the 16 mil film. Right, and it goes in that way round, I think. I think this is upside down. <laughs> I've got this upside down. It's amazing what you forget. Back in the early 70s, I was an assistant, and I did all the, all the loading of the magazines whilst David was, was shooting. What, what you should say is, is everything that we're doing now had to be done in the dark. So on location, that meant in, all done inside a black changing bag. And all this, you had to learn how to do this by braille, effectively. So that's all you do in the dark, that bit there. So the film's in there and it's loaded onto the sprockets here and inside there, as Dave said, that's where the, it, does a, it does a twist so that it comes out here into the take-up side. Uh, it runs through, you'd pull, pull that through. You've got to be very adept at it. You could load magazines in a changing bag very quickly and you could change the magazines very, very quickly. We always took, on average, well, the normal kit was three magazines. Each one's got 10 minutes of film in it. And as one was getting used up, the assistant would be loading, so we always had magazines to go. It was a hard job for the assistant to keep up uh, with loading the magazines if the camera's going non-stop. It did mean that the assistant was spent quite a lot of time with his hands in the changing bag. And if you needed him for other duties, like focus pulling, for example, uh, that could be a, a small problem. But I soon got the Eclair, and then immediately after that, I became block crew on Man Alive, which was a very, very high profile um, current affairs documentary series, which purported to have, uh, be telling not just straight documentary, but fairly topical and always human. The whole idea was getting human emotion into these films. Uh, which they did with various degrees of success. Um, but I, I did that program as a block crew, which is unusual. You're staying on the same program. Because mostly at, at, at film department, BBC, we were all expected to do absolutely anything. Panorama today and a drama tomorrow. But occasionally we did have block crewing. And I was block crew on Man Alive for two years. Did nothing else except Man Alive. Which I enjoyed enormously, really enormously. Because I loved the people I was working with and I liked the films we were making. And, and that's when I really pioneered my way of using this camera because they were very much ahead of the game and wanted to, everything to be a discrete filming. Don't use a tripod unless you absolutely have to and so on. And because I took to this camera so well, um, they seemed to think that they liked my style of doing things. So they hung on to me for two years. I really did enjoy it. It's under the 
direction of a marvellous man called Desmond Wilcox. On my first or second day there, and I met Desmond for the first time, he actually asked me to go and see him and talk to me about the, the philosophy and the culture of Man Alive. Yeah. And uh, I said, I, I know one thing about Man Alive, which is that we always zoom in on the tears. And he said, no, 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 no. We zoom out on the tears. That's what grabs people. Right, really? Yeah. Yes. He said, if you actually, if somebody starts to cry, if you just ease back just a little bit on the zoom, it shows how sensitive we are. Yeah. And people love it. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you a, a little odd anecdote about Man Alive, which is that we were once filming a, a documentary, a very typical Man Alive story, this, on death row in a Texas prison at a time when there was a moratorium on, on the death penalty and there's all these people who are banged up in, in death cells and had been there for years, um, waiting to die. It was a pretty powerful story and a very sensitive one. But a wonderful um, uh, researcher, Cherry... Cherry oh, yeah, Harris, Cherry. Yes. Yeah, Cherry. Anyway, we, uh, who'd, set this, who'd been to America and got this, uh, managed to get all the permissions, which has never, never been done before, to actually film inmates in death row with a marvellous reporter called Dennis Chewy. And I remember him too, yeah. The first day we were in there, and there was a lot, we were getting a lot of bad reaction. It wasn't really working at all. We had, to, we, we, we had a withdraw at five o'clock in the evening. We withdrew to the governor's office for a chat. And he said, they're all pretty pissed off. And we said, what's the problem? He said, well, they just don't like the, man, the name of the program. Of course, we were working with a clapperboard with Man Alive written all over it, and we're filming in death row. <laughs> and we, it never occurred to any of us at the time. I mean, why would you? <laughs> Yes. So we, had, we just had to change, we just took that off the clapperboard yeah. and, just, and just called it Texas Prison. And then they were quite happy. Yeah. <laughs> so we need another, another part of the, the crew, an essential part of the crew, Alex. <laughs> the PA. Coffee break, I <laughs> wish, I wish. Alex is a very important part of the crew because she was liaison <clears throat> for everybody. She keep the technical notes or the, the notes on the filming and the shot lists, but she'd all also provide us with uh, looking for the hotels, uh, provide us with tea at the tea breaks in the most extraordinary places and look after the comforts of all when you're in, uh, on, in arduous conditions. It took me, time, I think, time to realise just how much is going on behind the scenes. I mean, they were often working long after we'd wrapped They'd be sitting at, uh, in the, in the well, hotel. Rescheduling mainly. Yes. Typing out shot lists. Yes. Uh, endless typing yes. out of shot lists. All being done in the hotel after we'd gone off for our meal and we're, we're relaxing. But generally their job was to just look after everything. Us, the director, um, the catering, the hotel bookings, everything. It, it was a pretty impressive job. And the best did it incredibly well without even noticing. They were like the proverbial swan or serene on the surface and absolutely paddling, li paddling like mad underneath. The first thing is really this shot list is a, is a huge concern because one of the things in those days, we used to go away for very long periods of time, sometimes six-week locations, and we'd have to ring home to find out about the rushes. And we'd have this dreaded note from the man back who'd just seen them saying, roll 22, shot, whatever it was. No good. And we might have left the location, we might have been far away, and we had to hunt in my little book for where it was. And then we had to decide whether or not we were going back. It was a constant challenge getting rushes back. Um, we, we tried to get rushes off every night, wherever we were. And that could be in, in the middle of nowhere. I mean. And it was never done locally. I mean, we were filming in Hong Kong, but we were sending rushes back every night by, by plane. And more often than not, it was the poor old assistant's job to take the rushes to the airport. So he'd be working long after everybody else. Sometimes the PA went to the airport with the rushes. And then, as, as Alex says, the next morning, it's the dreaded phone call. And, and even sending from Hong Kong, you get a rushed report the next morning um, because it would be processed overnight and our film operations manager would view the rushes first thing in the morning and have a report ready for us. It was pretty impressive, actually, the turnaround. But uh, it was still 24 hours too late if something had gone wrong. Not like today, where you can play it back instantly and say, oh, better do that again. We didn't do that. One of the things that the PA often had to handle, often going off to make the phone call and yes. coming back, you could tell she's coming back, see what her face looks like, <laughs> and she's going, Oh, no. And equally, there weren't phones all over the place. You weren't um, going only no mobiles. 
Some of the hotels were just had sort of one shaky old phone in the lobby. No telex. Had to go to the local post office to find the telegram. Yes, the communications were... Well, very minimal. That's where the cameraman would really much talk to me because he couldn't tell the director what a lousy schedule it was. This happened a lot. I mean, I say it happened a lot. If there was some sort of confrontation of that type, mm. problems with schedule, problem with mm. being booked into dreadful mm. hotels, mm. the kind of thing that got a crew mm. pretty angry, mm. it was usually the first protocol was mm. the PA. Before you went to the director or the producer, it was always, I talk to the PA. In those days, we had quite a strict structure of the day. And in fact, I think, if I remember rightly, 10 o'clock till 5 p.m., 10 till 1700, was the working day. And anything outside those hours was overtime. Weekends, bank holidays, all overtime. And if you missed a meal because you've been driving about six hours and you hadn't seen a cafe, it was a penalty, a penalty meal. So that all that was money on the budget. A lot of memory of trying to keep lunches all jolly when well, you have a break you have a nice time you found a super restaurant you well everybody's having a nice time and you're thinking hmm it's nearly an hour it's nearly I mean, we've got to get going we cannot be sitting around here having a nice lunch we've got to get on so it was me who sort of because the director can't be seen to be oh come on now you know it was me who had to say come on yes and you we would use you as the go-between and, and well, that, that was very... Shamelessly. And, and that, yeah. funny enough, I'd forgotten how bossy I was in those days. <laughs> My mother said to me when I went home, I'm not your crew, you know. <laughs> Don't boss me. But, of course, that was part of it, wasn't it? We had to boss a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Hmm. It was a penalty for a totally missed meal. That would be a no-lunch break, an NLB. It went in the diary, NLB. Uh, yes. It would be a short break, which is less than an hour. That's... Um, Oh, SLB, yeah, that's another, another penalty, less than an hour. And you knew damn and, well uh, you had to go from another million miles in and the car. No, uh, no suitable food. We loved that suitable <laughs> word because we could apply it to anything. It wouldn't just, not just, it's cold, we're not, it's not a problem. If it was, food was, was unedible or for some reason, I don't know, you're in the souk in, in Cairo or something, um, then it was that, that would be a, um, a penalty payment as well. So it was a very complex system. Late lunch break, that was the other one. Anything, anything more than five hours since the last break was a penalty. And uh, I mean, it sounds bizarre now because people put up with so much uh, today. This is this dreaded typewriter Bring for the on. famous um, shot lists, which uh, actually a lot of girls, as you said, a lot of girls would do this in the evening back in the hotel. They'd type up their shot list. Also, of course, any change of schedule that's another reason you'd need a typewriter. And also, in, in our, the cases I work, a lot of the times I worked with uh, front men, as we call it, and I basically was um, yeah. typing up the sink pieces to camera. Well, I can't even get the thing open. You're like <laughs> me with a camera earlier on. I don't know, I remember is, how to open it. The thing is that this, uh, this shot list business is quite a fuss because you've only got to go away to, um, talk to a contributor, to arrange for the next location, to do this, to do that, and they've done about 20 odd shots. And you're, you know, you can, you can not, and you can never disturb, you can't disturb the cameraman, but I used to disturb the assistant cameraman. Yeah. And he'd help me. So always make friends with the assistant cameraman. Yes, quite. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He'd always open your typewriter for you. Thank you very much. And also catching up with what you might have missed, because he'd have a log of all the roles. The roles only lasted 10 minutes. Um, you've only got to have somebody talking away, as I've been doing. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got another role gone by. I had the stopwatch, but um, in documentaries, and the, a lot of the time, I wasn't always putting the watch on every second, obviously, for all the general shots. And, and often I didn't know what the shot was. I didn't dare look through the lens every moment, did I? I mean, you were all busy. Always welcome to look through mine. <laughs> but then today, and I still don't know how this works, they don't have a PA at all, and they go back into the, the cutting room with 4,000 yeah. hours oh, of a, for a half-hour documentary. How on earth they sort it out, I have no idea. There must be, somebody here can probably tell me, but I don't know how it works. I don't know how you work without awful. having no, proper records no, of what you're doing on awful, location. Awful. Then they called us sweetie girls, didn't they? Which, of course, I'd never minded being, uh, offering you a peppermint. Well, that was part, well, very part welcome. of it, yeah. <laughs> Buying the sweeties, yeah. 
Oh uh, dear, no, and, and also bringing the icebox along, didn't I? I always had a the icebox, especially when you're filming in the desert, for goodness sake, you have an icebox and you jolly well, you know, get, get it filled up every day and, and every morning in the hotel you'd fill it up with water or whatever. And, well, you know, it was quite a, you're miles away from anywhere lots of times, so there we are. What else? Money belt, look at that, that's a, very crucial not to lose the money or have it stolen or... Again, working in masses of different currencies, and you're not familiar with the notes, and you're always doing things slightly in the dark at the end of the day, and then maybe in some cafe, and having to pay your lighting men or, or whoever, whoever, and there you are in a fuss. I can remember when we were in um, Cairo, we took the night train to Luxor, and we, the train was to arrive at four o'clock in the morning, and we were all awake all night, you know, to list, wait for four o'clock in the morning. Come four o'clock, we all, train stops, we all to get out. No platform. All the gear had to be manhandled down onto the track. And at four o'clock in the morning, there wasn't a taxi to be seen, so we had to hire donkeys. <laughs> you imagine lifting all this gear, however many ex... I mean, we're talking about however many... Oh, goodness gracious, the weight alone, the poor donkeys. But at four in the morning, we were lucky to find a donkey. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, I was looking after the cameraman, actually. <laughs> but then... As long as he was happy, she could start concentrating on everybody else. Contributors. <laughs> the now, obviously, the assistant ob could feed his woes through her to the cameraman, in fact. Yeah, he was also often the butt of jokes, uh, with a certain amount of sort of casual sexism, probably. Yes. A lot of uh, the kind of thing that would have a feminist storming off these days, um, they had to put up with mm. a lot of sort of nudge, nudge, mm. sort of humour. Yes, I mean, you know, damn it. But um, well, we, we, In those days we were not quite so... But it worked the other way too because it meant, because there was a, a woman on location with us, it tempered our conversation quite a bit. Mm. If you're out and having a few drinks in the evening, it had never got too smutty. <laughs> because in those days you thought you mustn't get too smutty in front of a woman. It wouldn't bother anybody these days, but in those days it was kind of important. So they have a, a restraining influence on, on, on us sometimes. Well, here we are, gentlemen. It's a small room. It is a but, small uh, room, yeah. Have you got any thoughts about uh, how we want to set up? He's a medium size. Yeah. He's a medium sized sort of fellow. So can we move everything a bit further away yeah, from the wall? Yes, just give him a bit give more a space bit of, to you work. Can get in. some backlighting if we can. Yeah, yeah. And see where we go from there. Um, right, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Want to hear what I want to light it with? Right. Um, if we get, I'd like to get the blonde in the corner. We we'll have to move that piece of furniture, I think and get the blonde in the corner with at least one level of trace on it for a bit of fill light. Um, and a redhead there, redhead there. Another one over there just put some light on the background. Okay. Bill, how do you want to mic this? Well, I can't hear any, anything really terrible in the way of background noise. Um, uh, so I should probably use a short boom. Over the top. I'd like to get rid of that table. Yeah. Um, okay. And we'll set up the tripod about, about here. Just enough room to get the lamp behind me. Well, if we do reverses, we might move it back in okay. to the background, but otherwise we don't need it. Spray it with some continuity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't like the wallpaper, do you? <laughs> you know well, it's not so much the wallpaper as the kittens. I'm not yes, on I, think we could, I think the kittens <laughs> might have to go, actually. What about sizes on this? Well, I do you want me to change sizes during questions? There's only going to be three questions. I think I'd close in on the on the last one okay so while you're answering the, asking the last yeah, question so about sort of midish because we don't want a massive wind around it no and of course no. i don't know how much you're going to move i pop this in for the moment dave but of course it's uh yes uh, get it in as soon as you like flexible according to what uh, you yeah. want to do yeah 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 because we should hopefully stop about there yeah. there's a there you yeah. can see how it goes it should be there um, how are you doing, John? You want a double paper or a single? Um, on the, on the, I think on the, we probably want double. Double? Okay. Yeah. Ray, can you just yes, sit it. down there for yes. me for a second then? All right. Well, the interview's going to be over there. Yeah. All right. But well, you're going to be asking questions from here. I will, yeah. Because I need to get right I'll behind. Have to shut. <laughs> <laughs> He's not deaf. David, do you want uh, Ray a bit closer? 
Closer to what? Closer to the camera? Closer to the interviewer. Um, well, it's up to you. It doesn't matter, really. Uh, you, are you a little uncomfortably far away? No. It's we can, we can bring you up if you like. I'm not sure. That we're we're just, just, the closer we go, the more the eye line goes off. Yeah. Well, we can go in there like that. Just make sure my... Tuck you in there like that. Yeah. Enough room for the shoulder. David, you go in incandescent. Yes. Yes, well, everything's inky, yeah. If I just sit in for a minute, you can see how much windage you need around him. So you might do that, you never know. People frequently do, they never keep their head in the same position twice. So they move. They move. <laughs> well, unless, of course, they go to sleep. I've seen the camera do a quiet sort of up oh, and yes. down when the yes. cameraman's gone to sleep in the middle. Know, that's, uh, we might need... that's, that's a, a bit high. Ray was up here, yeah. Okay, I'll get the baby legs. Unless this will spread somewhat, won't, will it? No, no I've got baby legs for this. Okay. The, that's this full... Oh, sorry, I'd already put a stand there. It's all right. I'll have a look at the map box and see if it's done the air right. Uh, I can't know how to operate this, but I'll try. Mm. Yeah, well, it goes it, off really quick. <laughs> so, it it's probably quite a good idea if I explain how I'm starting this as well. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. Obviously, as you've seen, uh, uh, pictures uh, very often come first, and uh, perhaps they should, but it's worth bearing in mind that uh, it doesn't happen too much these days, but when television at home breaks down, it's uh, usually, the, or sometimes the picture, but the programme will be con continuing sound only very often, uh, which is, thank you very much. Bill, where are you going to make this now? Yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm going to mark it Bill. with that little boom. I thought we were putting out, we are, you're sitting in. You're, yeah. you're sitting in at the moment. I'm sitting yeah. in, but, but that, the real one will come in is, a moment. This is the sort of thing that I would have chosen to do. Will we still get that high enough, Dave? It was too high on the uh, on the. Yeah, but will legs. the babies be a bit, a bit I low? I think so, yeah. I think you'll find that will be just perfect. Thanks, Maddie. I'll get this up. See you like that. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. I'd That's forgotten about the size of those miller heads there. <laughs> yeah. And the weight. Were they? Oh. About 20 kilos. Wasn't necessarily built for that. Oh, it's 15 amp on there. Yeah, oh, fair God. a fair amp. <laughs> We're not going to blow his mains, are we? I don't think we have one of those, do we? Ah. We're not going to blow his mains, are we? No, no, no. We got right. right, you want me to replace this with the redhead? Well, I think that might be the quickest way of getting around the problem, yes. Yeah. So you've lost your blonde and you've now got a redhead? Yep. You're happy with that, are you? Very happy. <laughs> oh, here, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's hey. the other end, Dave. Uh, Alan. Thank I'm you. I've got a load of mag. What okay. uh, stock would you like, David? Uh, we'd better do the 200, I think. Okay. Now, this one, um, that one's where it, you want it there, do you? It's a kick light. Put a bit of paper, paper on, on that, that well. if you don't mind. I can squeeze yeah. the doors up or you can... No, just, uh, just leave the doors well open and... Uh, and put put a paper? Yeah, please. Okay. Do you want it very high or...? No, uh, no, no more than I'm that. thinking of that shadow of the, put the... on the wall at the back. That's out of shot. I think he might be, shot, depending right. on this seat, he might be a few inches higher than me. Yes, the, the bring right. the yeah.
Ah. Right. <laughs> right. You might want to put a bit of paper, paper on, on that, that if you don't mind. I can yeah. squeeze the doors up, or you can. No, just uh, just leave the doors well open and, uh, and put, put some... a paper. Yeah, please. Okay. Do you want it very high, or no, uh, no, no more than I'm that. thinking of that shadow of the put the on the wall at the back. That's out of shot. I think he might. Be, shot, depending right. on this seat, he might be a few inches higher than the yes, other. We're we'll bringing right. them in. Yeah, yeah that's going to be. Have to be bit... Close the doors that, that are Mongolian on the, on the curtains. On the curtain, right, okay. I told you, mate, the That's the end of, of the film which identifies the film, and I usually put that on the magazine to keep that always with the film. It's a good, it's a good label. And then we take, making sure that this is the take up side. The film gets threaded onto the roller and then should come out there. There we go. And just tighten this loop up again so that it doesn't scratch, doesn't rub on anything. Right, so we should have 12, 12 frames there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 clear frames out there and take the center sprocket goes on that so that when it goes on the camera frame the uh, pull down claw engages with the top at the top of the stroke when it goes back into the roll there it sits flat Did you get sync all right bill no this is a demonstration of this nagra 3 we're in test and we can see the meter bouncing as I pick up the microphone. One, two, one, two, three. Now we're going to record. So I engage the transport, go to record, and now I'm recording. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. One, two. Now we'll stop. Put the mic down, we'll go into rewind, and then engage the transport again, go into playback, one, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, one, two, now we'll stop, now I can rewind again. Engage the transport. One, two, one, two, three, one, two. Now we'll stop. It's a good sounding Nagra 3. Did you get sync all right, Bill? No. Oh, the camera's not running. Not at the moment, no. It's going to work. Oh, I remember the days with sync leads and the well, missing well, sync leads. That's where lead. we are now. <laughs> Uh, I used to keep the gate as clean and dry as possible because yeah. then the hairs don't stick to any grease. Yeah, yeah. well, we all had our... That's, we all had our I did it the wrong way. Ways. For years, I did it the wrong way. Did you? Yeah. Which way was that? That way. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you oldies. <laughs> right, oh, I didn't put a roll number on there. That would help. <coughs> so we've got the full ident then. Yeah, I used to put the roll yeah. number on here. Yeah, so what... So we've got a full mag. Full mag, 10 minutes. Oops. Is it running? Perfect. Sweet. Yep. Nice and quiet. Nice. So are we, are we in business then? It, yep. it seems that we might have a chance of... Uh, ah, right. Something. I think we could fetch our interviewee now, Ray. Available now? Yeah. Sorry to delay you, but we had a minor technical problem, which of course is uh, not unusual. No. <laughs> it's very bright. Right. Mind the wires. We tried to protect your floor in the meantime. Daisy, are you with us? We Good. got 2.8. I think we're. So. Okay. Comfortable? Yeah. How's that mic? Bill, are we? Yeah. A little? Oh, then this will have to be adjusted. Okay. When you're ready, Bill. Yeah. Bill, we've got a mic adjusted. problem. Mm -hmm. A bit close, I'm yep, afraid. I'm just going to check that. Give a bit more wind on that. Now the professor's right, here. We'll, uh, yeah. 
see how we're I doing. was going to try and do it. We have to do a thing called an eye line test, as it were. So okay. don't speak to that. No. Speak to me. To you. Yeah. So it, it just gives you a more. Okay. And, and it, you can be then addressing the audience, mm -hmm. not me, because I'm not there. Well, as much as not there as I can be. Oh, we'll try. Okay. And I'll give you a quick run through about what it is I'd, I'd like to ask you to, mm -hmm. to tell us. I have um, about three questions. Um, if you can give me another. Yep, yeah, sure, no problem. Right. Basically, um, there'll be three basic questions, one of which is your early experience of television, one of which what made you decide to think yeah. of going into it, mm -hmm. Thank you. and then really, um, well, probably change the order maybe, your early career, okay. and then into television, yeah. and what you maybe think of it now, but uh, maybe you haven't got enough footage for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good. Are we all right, Bill? Yeah, I think so. We'd better do a quick, we'll do a voice level test because my voice is light and yeah. annoying and yours is infinitely better. And anyway, it's the voice we want to hear. Well, so. com very complimentary. So. <laughs> oh, this is has, has, somebody, uh, Ronnie, has somebody switched the phone off? Yeah, I, I double checked that. I had it off and I've checked the clock. Um, the church next door, I think, doesn't strike and there are no ice cream vans, so you won't have green sleeves all over again. Nor any ice cream. <laughs> no, well, sorry about that. You'll have to put up with it for afterwards. Okay, sir. Well, if you're sitting comfortably, are we ready, gentlemen? Yep. All right, Bill? Yep. Okay. Um, Hang on a second. I've just got to put the date on the clapperboard. Oh, yes, that'll help. What is the date? I think it's the 15th, but I've lost count too. <laughs> 15th of June, 1972. <laughs> right, sir. 15. It I... feels like a long time ago, anyway. It probably by the end of it mm. over, it'll feel like a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the, there was a film called The Longest Day. There was. This might well be yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, John? Yep. yep. Right. Okay. Okay. Daisy, okay. After the board. Okay. Running. Okay. Okay, Dan. Running. Eighty-six, take one. Professor. Tell me your earliest experiences of television um, and what, you, what did it make you feel? Well, I, I grew up with television, so I think I arrived in the house about the same time as the TV. And I think it, that was a major achievement. And nowadays, you know, um, it's become a matter of historical and archival record. That must be very satisfying indeed. If you're all happy, gentlemen, I think we'll say cut. Thank you. Uh, check the gate, please. Okay. The one thing we don't want is hairs. It sounds sort of slightly sort of botanical. Come, well, hairs do get in the gate, and they always get in just there. <laughs> so it's worth checking. Sorry, sir. So how do you check for that? You look in carefully and blow. If it's there, you can usually see it. And he's got good eyesight, so we're pretty okay. <laughs> But it, you normally, yeah. the, one of the sad things about this old system in a way is that, of course, it's total trust. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, if Dave says it's fine, I won't know until it comes back yeah. from the chemist, by which time it's too late. Yeah, the gate's clear. Thank you, sir. All right, Smill, I should yes, have asked fine. you. Thank okay, you. fine. Hmm? That was good. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Nice thank you for your patience. Well, thank you. <laughs> a bit arduous for what seems like a short time, but <laughs> good. So all that setting up, and how, mu how much, how long was that actually? Uh, Daisy, what do you think, about three, four minutes? You must have... About three minutes, 33. Perfect. Thank you. Just what we wanted. Okay. Yeah. I know it seems a short line, but we can pack a lot in. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. There right. it is. How are we... want to do reverses, right? Uh, hmm. Okay, well, I'm... Turning over? Okay. Oh, oh, hang on, since I'm right. Oh, that's... Guaranteed. <laughs> Say when. Okay. Running. 88 take one. Oh, so 88 take one. Professor, this is the most marvellous place to actually have a Department of Media and Art Studies. How did it come to be here and what it is that you actually do? Because it must be inspirational to see and be here. 
Well, it's our best standing set, this building, which, which is over 100 years old. We've been doing media here almost 20 years now, and it's always been practice-based. So we've got over 200 students, undergraduates, on a course where half their work is in practice, and the other half is in history and theory, and another 50 or so master's students. This started off as a women's college, and we've always been proud that our department has had a lot of female students. I think we may have to ask you to do that again because we've had every single tribulation that it can be guaranteed apart from the ice cream van. Is that all right for you, Devon? Yep. Still running. We're still running. Hold. Oh. And board then. Shall I cut? Cut, yes. Safe film. Oh, we'll go 88 tape. You're going to do the same thing, are you, Roy? Ray? Yeah, 88 2. Put it on 2 because it'll be okay. logged. Okay. Uh, all eyes peeled from anything you could possibly see. There's one more aircraft, I think. Have yeah. you got the chalk? I have one. Sorry? Oh, I've got chalk. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. We're ready to go the second that John thinks it's okay. It'll be, give us the most time. Okay. So you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Okay, should we turn over now? Okay. Say when. Running. Time running. 88 take two. Professor, this is the most marvellous spot to have a Department of Media and Arts. It must be inspiration. What is it you do here and how does it work? It must be great. Well, we've been teaching media here uh, for about 20 years now. We have over 200 students who are on a degree which is half practice based. So they're making films, um, producing films, scripting films and so on. Um, we have another 50 master's students and it really is a wonderful place to be because a lot of the students live on campus so you get that real team feeling. Take it, cut. The theory is there's a BBC crew, in very small, it's usually six, in fact you've seen it, this is the size of a BBC crew. It's handleable, it's friendly, we all know each other, we know what we do we really don't have to tell each other what to do. The only one who gets told what to do is usually me because I'm either in the way, in shot, out of shot, or actually sort of, well, not clearly telling them what I ought to do. Then they'll ask, and if it's wrong, they'll tell me, which I rely on. The other great thing about it is that it all works on trust. The one thing you never do as a matter of absolute principle is you don't look down the eyepiece unless you ask. You ask out of courtesy, and if it's so, if you ask too often, it implies mistrust, which of course, since we get it away from the laboratories, we don't know until we see it back. Otherwise, we're all happy, because if David says it's okay, it's okay. If Bill says it's okay, it's okay. That's the way it works, and it makes a big difference. When you have a hundred crew, you can't do that. But this, apart from aircraft noise, is ideally how it should be. It's obviously easier for everybody if we kept the same film stock all the time, um, not least because otherwise the, the assistant is going to be constantly having to keep one mag with one lot and two mags with something else and, and he's having to try and guess what, what we're going to be needing next. If, uh, and uh, if I suddenly say, look, I've changed my mind, I want the tungsten stock in there or, or I want the daylight stock in, suddenly it's a panic into the changing bag to change it all again. So We've got three mags full of, full of uh, tungsten stock and we suddenly wants to go outside. So it can be a nuisance that. I mean, you try to plan ahead, obviously, but mostly on, uh, on documentary work, you'd use a tungsten stock all the time and uh, hardly ever use a daylight stock. I, I didn't use it. I used a daylight stock only the last few years doing drama um, when you're trying to get the optimum on daylight filming. And there was a daylight stock, which was very slow, actually. Only 25 ASA, wasn't it, that one? 50, 50, 50 D. Yes. 50 D Kodak. Uh, but it was very fine grain. It was a lovely stock. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Good contrast. Yes. But films, films always more forgiving. Negative films always more forgiving on uh, exposure and stuff, because you can always save a bad situation. It's always better to, it's always better to overexpose than underexpose. You can always get back from, from un overexposure, but you can't necessarily get back from underexposure.
That's right, yeah. Overs. Yes. Yeah. It's easier to, to retrieve film that's overexposed than underexposed. Yeah. If you're underexposed, there's, then there's nothing in the shadow, there's nothing to retrieve. But yeah. You which can is actually... Sorry. Go on. Yeah. Which is opposite to video. So. Yeah, that's, that's true, I think, yes. Mm. Yeah. First of all, I check what roll number the sound recordist was on because I hadn't been with the camera crew just preceding this shot. So I want to keep up with what the roll numbers are equally for the, for the camera and the actual, and check the shot and, um, and sort of yeah, make sure that, you know, when, when the camera is running that I've got a, a, got a clock on it. And um, also, of course, if it's a good take or not. I mean, this was a very short, as you know, a very short take, but um, sometimes they can go on up to 14 or 15 or 16, and therefore you do need a note of what the good one is. She's absolutely vital. She's the eyes, ears and diplomacy of the whole operation. If somebody has to go and silence a bunch of workmen with a pneumatic drill, you can bet your life Alex can do it. Um, this is the sort of, but it's also, you can only uh, do a job like this with a proper working index. Um, when the rushes come back or they're sent to London and you're in the middle of Algeria, you ring up and it says it's 40, whatever it is, you've got a problem. It's a hair in the gate or whatever. You've got that with you. I can't do that because in theory, I should be listening and watching what's happening. That's why I've probably overshot that end board because I wasn't watching trucks going that way. With a little more practice, if we'd actually chosen the location a little more carefully with the recce, then you would know there is an aircraft flight path, there's a crossroads and things like that. But I can only really end this piece by saying the words of Sir Mortimer Wheeler, one of the world's best archaeologists, who said, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. Hi, we've got the 60mm roll of film that's exposed, we've read the camera sheets, we know what we're supposed to be doing with it. So the first step is to go into the dark room and make it up in total dark conditions. So that rolls in the magazine, so it's ready for processing. So there's a finite amount of time to make this change. These lights alert the operator to where the elevator in here is. They're staple joints, which have to be pretty specifically done. We'll then check the lace up in this light trap. Wind the tension back into the magazine, check the lace up is absolutely perfect. And we release this magazine. This is now feeding into this elevator. This is like a reservoir of film on an elevator and while there's no film being fed in here while we're making that change, that elevator is actually rising in here to feed this machine which is running at 100 feet a minute. Okay, so what's happening now, the film is coming through this um, elevator and it's coming into the first solution. Now the first solution is backing removal. So film has uh, manufactured on it something called an anti-halation backing. It has to come off the film because otherwise, if you process the film and that didn't come off, the film wouldn't be transparent. So the first thing that comes off is the backing in this solution here. The next thing is it will go into the actual developing solution, which is the um, Kodak patented ECN2 color neck solution. The film, is, the film is made of silver halide crystals suspended in a gelatin emulsion with color dyes. When it comes out the camera, it's obviously a latent image. So those silver halide crystals, as they've been exposed to light, have been excited by the light and, they, and that actually activates them. They are what actually make the image. When it comes out of there, it actually go, it goes into an acid stop and the acid stop immediately stops the processing uh, procedure, the developing procedure. It's obviously crucial that the, that the film stays in the solutions for a very specific amount of time, at very specific temperatures and at very specific rates of replenishment from our chemistry upstairs. This ensures that if we run for eight hours or 10 hours continuously, the processing solutions have exactly the same consistency and strength as they did at the beginning of the shift. And we control all of this with these chemical control units over here. It's, uh, it's akin to stills photography, analog stills photography. Each solution has a very specific purpose. 
right. The actual emulsions have now gone through a developing solution. They've been developed. It comes out of the acid and it goes into a bleach. Then it's not very much of an apparent image at this stage. This is going into the bleach. So the film is no longer sensitive to light, even though at the moment it doesn't look like traditional transparent negative. It will do when it gets into the fix. Okay, so it's come from the bleach, now into the wash, backwards and forwards, from one solution to the next. And between all the solutions, there's wiper blades, which you can see here, which take off the excess fluid from one solution to the next to minimize and stop any carryover and contamination. And that will go in. So this, this is the fix, and you'll, you'll be able to see here, you can see the film changing into, a, into an apparent image while it's in the fix, okay? So it comes in as this kind of overall orangey color into here. If you held this up to the light now, which you'll see shortly, you'll see it is actually the image that you've recorded in the camera. So you'll see shortly this will be coming out of the final rinse stabilizer through this block of wipers and into the drying cabinet. And you'll see it's an apparent image here. So this is now the fully processed egg. It just needs to be dry. Right, so the film is in this cabinet here. This is this cabinet here, as you can see, coming through. This cabinet is drying the film. If you over dry the film, you induce a curl in the film, which means that it will not sit flat on a telecine gate or in a printing gate thereby causing potential focus issues when you're trying to transfer or scan it or print it. If you don't dry it quite correctly enough and there's moisture left in the film and it takes up on a wind, then it will adhere to itself on the wind and potentially um, damage the emulsion when you try to unwind it. So this is a mirror image of the other end. Where's the other end? The elevator rises to, to, feed, the, to feed the machine. This actually, this elevator will descend to absorb the film that's coming through. So as you can see, this elevator's falling here. So again, we have a specific amount of time. We have a specific amount of time to make the change here, to take this camera roll off while that elevator's falling. Obviously, the elevator is, cannot hit the bottom. If it gets to the bottom, you've got a major problem. The machine will stop. So the machine never stops and starts while there's film on it. And it's these elevators that work to allow that to happen both ends. So you can see this is actually, a, you will see when we stopped it, but this is actually an apparent image as it's exposed. And it looks fine, so it looks like the laser in the camera was okay. This is the end of that camera roll now coming through. So that will go into that can, which is the can that's come out of the darkroom. So we know exactly that that's, that can's followed it. When we're running all night on production, this is obviously normally the next roll of a film. We just process this one roll. Right. right, I've got the neg from Nigel, and what I need to do now is I need to make it up into a roll that's usable on a telecine machine. So I need to add a head and a tail leader, and I also need to punch holes for the, in the, for the edge numbers. So on the telecine machine, they have a start and a finish point. Now I've got to the head, and what I have to do, I need to punch a hole for the telecine up to start. And right at the edge, end here, I've got a hole complete edge number. So I'm going to write that edge number down. I'm also going to punch a hole in the dot frame. I'll punch a hole in the dot frame. So when this, this gets put on the Tully City machine, he will run this from the heads until he gets that dot, that dot in the middle of, his tele, of the aperture of the Tully City machine. And you'll see it on the screen. And that's when he starts recording the edge numbers. and. Uh, and the, the action. There's the frames, so let's just apply a reference point. There's a punch hole, so I zero all my counters at that point. And the first thing I will do is check that I'm in focus. So the one thing that I can't control from the desk is the focus. So that's a knob on the front of the gate. There it is. Okay, so we're in focus. Okay, well here we are. I'm looking at the first images on the film, so I'm just sort of seeing what settings I need to start with on my grading controls, to, which will be dependent on things like the lighting at the time, the type of film stock that was, was used. 
by eye and experience, adjusting the controls here so that our friend on the screen looks a reasonably neutral sort of colour. So I have controls, knob controls for Master Gamma, which is the response of the machine between black and white. This is colour lift, I'm just arbitrarily using the this boosts the, the setting I have boosts the magenta cast in the low lights. Now I don't really want any of that, so I'll turn it off. I can make the whole scene black and white if I want. I can adjust the total saturation so I can overcook it a bit for that sort of slightly garish technicolour look. Now the BBC through experimentation in the early days of colour came to the conclusion that for the most convenient arrangement of adjustments um, for colour correction live on air as it was at the time was to have two joysticks and the left hand one the knob on the top adjusts the lift which is the black level in the picture and the movement adjusts the colour gamma which strictly speaking is the mid-tone colour balance but that has the most effect on a picture and the look of a picture rather than colour lift which has less effect and doesn't generally need adjustment between scenes and the right hand joystick is all to do with the highlights the whites the gain so turning the knob on the top alters the master gain so I can completely overdrive things or turn it down and moving the stick around affects the colour balance in primarily the highlight areas of the scene. So having got an idea of what I'm faced with here I shall rewind the film to the start of this scene and we run it through largely in, in real time and I'll put cues in the grading computer at the uh, appropriate places. But the beauty of one of these Mark III type telecines over its predecessors is that it will fast wind back and forth rather like a tape recorder. The predecessors, the twin lens type telecines, um, because of their mechanical and, and optical mechanisms could only um, run at real time forwards and backwards. So for the sort of activity that we now call post-production, it was quite a drawback because obviously if you wanted to just take a clip from 10 minutes into a 30 minute film, you had to wait 10 minutes to get there. Whereas with one of these type of machines, it fast winds down in a matter of moments at about 10 times real time speed. Ah, this looks very fine actually. It um, is well exposed. I'm not having to put any um, extreme corrections in. It's nice and steady and it's nice and clean. So, um, this is good. There we are, bong. Change of scene. Now, unfortunately, this gentleman's been shot out of focus by the original crew. So, um, there's not much I can do about that. Out of focus is out of focus. Otherwise, his exposure is fine, but he's out of focus. Oh, there's a change of scene here. This is very different exposure. The highlights, the sky behind our friend here, is very bright and is very dense on the film. So what I can do here, just to even the look of the images out, is put a dynamic change in my grading system. A dynamic change is where I ask the grading computer to put a, a, a transition, a change between two grading settings over a period of time, between two cues. A gradual change to perhaps compensate for a camera movement or a gradual change in lighting on location which might be unavoidable as the sun goes in and out behind clouds, something along those lines. So if I get this right, you're not aware of the change happening because it's the sort of thing your eyes would naturally do looking around from a darker shadowy scene to, to a highlight. The noises you can hear, the bongs you can hear, are made by the Digigrade grading computer when it was developed back in the 1980s uh, it was said to be one of the most vocal devices around at the time most electronic devices probably made just beeps if they made any kind of noise at all right I think we're coming to the end of the film now from the look of it on the, on the machine and there we are that is the very end there's a punch hole just gone through, so that would have been the lab's mark, but that is the end of, of the film.
So my settings are stored in the computer's memory. We have 17 queues in the whole film. And from start to finish, it runs for 8 minutes and 14 seconds and 3 frames. Now for long-term storage, I can copy the, 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 the queues, the grading file information to a floppy disk. Now remember, this is 1980s technology, so a floppy disk was the, the height of sophistication in those days. Right, what I, what I shall do now is rewind the film. And then, all being well, we are ready to go for a, uh, a tape, a recording. Now we sit back and think, what a wonderful piece of work, and doesn't it look good? Okay, let me just find my cues and start points. Flip a switch there. We have a device in the, in the equipment bays which interfaces the telecine machine to the edit controller, and as far as the edit controller is concerned, the telecine machine appears and behaves like a beta SP videotape recorder. So that's what the edit controller thinks it's controlling. I have a digibeta tape already queued up in the recorder. So all I have to do is press record and here we go. It all runs up to make a frame accurate edit. And now we can sit back and luxuriate in the results. The object being to deliver on tape a complete unbroken recording of the film. We have two monitors in, in front of us. Uh, the left-hand one is showing me the output of the telecine machine, and the right-hand one is a confidence replay, if you will, from the Digibeta recorder, so that I can check that I am actually recording what I think I'm recording. Uh, and the black and white monitor on top is the character's display from the video recorder. Above the left-hand monitor is a, uh, a waveform scope, which is showing me the red, the green, and the blue components as they come out of the telecine. So that, that is a guide to me for the grading process, and it helps me to ensure that the, um, the colors are neutral and natural, and I'm not clipping any low lights or highlights. To my right here is the character display from the edit controller. So on there I can see the cues that I've put in for the, uh, the edit points, and um, the progress of, of the operation, whether I'm in assemble edit or insert and video and audio and so forth. And here we are, we're coming up to the end of the piece. So I'll just wait for the last punch hole to go through, which there it is, and we are done. Running. 89 take one. Eighty-eight take two. Professor, this is the most marvellous spot to have a Department of Media and Arts. It must be inspirational. What is it you do here and how does it work? It must be great. Well, we've been teaching media here uh, for about 20 years now. We have over 200 students who are on a degree which is half practice based. So they're making films, um, producing films, scripting films and so on. Um, we have another 50 master's students and it really is a wonderful place to be because a lot of the students live on campus so you get that real team feeling. Thank you. Cut. Fun. Cutaways. Professor, tell me, what was your first experience of television and what did you feel it did to you? Did it affect you in any way? Well, I, I grew up with television, so I think I arrived in the house about the same time as the TV, and I think it was um, a way for my parents not to have to talk to each other so much. So um, I can remember, you know, I grew up with, with all those wonderful children's shows like uh, Captain Pugwash, you know, little bits of moving cardboard and puppets like Andy Pandy, and particular favourite was the Flowerpot Men. I remember kind of imitating them with my mother and things like that, my little brother. So that was my earliest memory, it was just kind of, you know, it, it was always there. Yes. And then going on, remembering um, the programmes I wasn't allowed to watch, that my parents um, sometimes would let me, sometimes wouldn't. So a lot about tonight, the programme tonight, 
um, with Cliff Mitchell Moore, I can remember very vividly being sent to bed because they were doing something about the, the Russian Revolution. And they were showing all this footage and I was sent to bed. I wasn't allowed to watch that. I think it was seven o'clock at night or something. So I, I can't remember what year that would be. What was the moment that maybe you wanted to work in television? Did it attract you as a, a medium, a way of communicating, or simply, not being rude, a way of making a living, which is <laughs> what we do? Well, I should be perfectly honest, um, I didn't really want to go into television. I, I <laughs> wanted to go into movies, and I realised, you know, this was the end of the 1970s, there wasn't much of a film industry around, and actually all the interesting things were happening on, on TV. And I'd seen a lot of movies, because I'd done a degree in English literature, which meant that I actually had a lot of time to go and see movies, yeah. and there were lots of films around, and um, that's really where I, I kind of wanted to be. And then I realised that television was was the was the industry of the future, if you like, because um, I'd watched a lot of TV. Um, and I got my chance in 1982 with the beginning of Channel 4. So I'm one of those kind of renegade independents, proposed a cinema series to Channel 4, and I think we got, I, I was working with two people who actually knew what they were doing, because I was just an academic. Um, and I think we got our chance because nobody else had proposed such a programme. Can you tell me about your early career in television and what its outcome was? It's it, always a disappointment. Making a programme, it's all, you, you always get disappointed. It's never actually what you'd imagined to begin with. And it was, you know, looking back now and, and, and seeing some of these programmes again, I think, well, actually, that's quite an achievement what we did there. But at the time, I was always slightly ashamed that we'd not quite achieved what we wanted to do. I could see all the faults, you know, there was problems with the sound, there was problems with the picture. We didn't get that interview. We should have asked this question. We should have just gone that extra mile. And actually, the problem is, as an independent, you know, you don't go the extra mile sometimes because you haven't got the extra money. That's your own personal money that goes the extra mile and that, that you don't want to do. So it's always that sense of disappointment with making television. But looking back, having done you know, the first ever history of, of cinema in China, for example. That was a major achievement. And nowadays, you know, um, it's become a matter of historical and archival record. Thanks very much indeed, Professor. Thank you again.